right. It should. Okay, here we go. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Childress. I am the manager of interpretation here at Stratford Hall. I am filling in for Dr. Kelly Fanto Dietz, our director of um, education, uh, programming education and visitor engagement. And I am joined here today by John Bachman. Hi, John. And he is our, your, your title is outreach and it's, education. Yeah, I believe it, 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 I could make up a title, but I, I think this is close, okay? Coordinator of uh, education and public outreach. Okay, and no, actually I know what your title is. It is um, paleontology guru, is that right? Is that what I remember hearing? Yeah, that's the informal one, you that's know? The informal, okay, well, we're, well, we can be informal. Well, I would just like to welcome you all today. We have a wonderful program planned for you um, about whales. So we are gonna go ahead and get started. All righty. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, uh, and we're about ready to, uh, well, there it is. Okay, so. Um, Just a second to get it set up on slideshow mode. Sure. There we are. Perfect, I think. Okay, so um, th when I started doing this, the program sort of evolved um, from just about whales to something that's, uh, that is more, um, what, global or encompassing, and that's the whole idea of what the fossil record is, and what does that mean, and how, do I, how does the Stratford whale figure into this fossil record? So this is going to be a little journey today about uh, understanding stuff about, um, not only about whales, but also about the big picture of life on Earth. Okay, next. There we go. Now, okay, so June 4th, big day, uh, 2013, uh, we discovered, I discovered um, a portion of a skull, and that's in the upper left-hand uh, picture there uh, of the three. Uh, this, yes, th hey, thanks a lot, Kelly. You're welcome. There you got the, uh, the official uh, arrow pointer. Anyway, yeah, that's the picture of the first day of discovery. Um, underneath that is the picture of the um, uh, plaster jacket that encompassed the skull to the right, and which is now in the, in the uh, basement of the uh, preservation gallery here at Stratford. Um, yeah, it created a big, big fuss uh, when we found this thing. Uh, man, we were inundated with requests from the media to talk about whales and to talk about, you know, how it was found and what, where it's going to go and things like that. Very exciting. Next slide. So, no, a question for you, John. How did you find this? Were you just walking around down there and you're like, oh, this looks like something in the cliff? Can you go back one slide? To the, the beginning? Yeah, here we go. Okay, that's me. Yeah, here. Our discovery, yeah, that little arrow in my head there. Anyway, um, this is taken, this, this picture was taken uh, about, oh, I'd say a half hour after I saw the, uh, the picture. Uh, the photograph was taken by a friend of mine. Uh, I was accompanying two geologists and paleontologists as they were studying the micro uh, planktonic fossils that are found at the different layers. And they're doing this to uh, each of the layers is not just a formation. These are the formations um, or the geological parts, so to speak, of the cliffs uh, are divided into what are called members. And these there are 26 members of the cliffs. Each member has a distinct community uh, or, uh, or biome of plankton. And it's the plankton that really helps us decide where one member ends and another begins. So they're there, uh, Dr. Robert Weems and O'Brien Landacre, and these two guys were like collecting little baggies of sediments from different members along the face of that cliff. And I'm walking behind them. And as I'm walking behind them, you can go to the ne that next picture. I noticed that things sticking out of the cliffs. 
Now they're ahead of me by about 25, 30 yards. And I know I recognized it as a very piece of a large skull. I knew it would be a piece of a large skull. Didn't know how complete it was. Didn't know its orientation into the cliff, whether it was going horizontal or was it going vertically into it or wherever, right? So I yelled down to the beach, hey guys, look what you've missed. And they came back and were astonished. And of course we, didn't begin excavations. Excavations would take two and a half, three months. Wow. And as slowly as we opened it up and slowly brought it out. And that, uh, so in June, that's when that picture was taken. August is when the picture of the plaster jacket was taken. So that gives you an idea of how long it took. Yeah, it was quite serendipitous. They didn't recognize it. Of course, their focus was somewhere else. And I was just sort of cruising along, you know? So, yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Wow. Yeah. And, and so that the skeleton that you see on the right in those is, <laughs> is, the, is half of it that was brought out. It was, it's roughly under seven feet long. It's almost six, six and a half feet long. Wow. That's incredible. And yeah. think, no, it was just, no, just it, there. It, and all you saw was that little bit pointing, uh, sticking out of the cliff. That's incredible. <laughs> I know, it was so cool. Okay. Well, we knew that uh, because of its orientation in the cliff, that, uh, and you remember the pictures, um, it was between two formations. Formations are the fancy name that geologists and paleontologists use to delineate or to tell one, uh, one type of sediment, one type of community, one type of rock from another, and uh, so the, our, our guy was found at what they call the contact between the Miocene Calvert and the Miocene Chop Tank formations. And uh, so, and it was, and we're still figuring it's about 65% complete, which is amazing because, uh, and we'll talk about the fossilization process later, uh, but that is it. That's now uh, we'll talk more about that stuff. Here we go. So, so the picture here on the slide, is that, Kind of what we the on the slide is of a minke whale, M I N K E. Minke whales aren't real big, but they are baleen whales. And though our guy is extinct, the, it would look like, very much look like uh, this guy, the uh, a minke whale, M I N K E. Okay. <laughs> okay, so it's 25 feet long. And it had, and I've got a complete six foot skull. It might be a little bit bigger, but that's what it looks like on the side. And I wanted to show you, uh, uh, you know, the audience, the, you know, here's the skeleton, there's the whale, right? So you can see, and we'll be seeing other pictures of skeletons of, of uh, skeletal structures of whales as we, as we go on. Okay. Okay, it's official name. Right, it has an official name. It is Thetis, it is, is Thinocetus arthriticus. Uh, it's a member of an extinct family of baleen whales, again, extinct family of baleen whales called the Cetotheridae. Okay, the picture that you see uh, uh, right there is at the uh, on uh, the Calvert Marine Museum on Solomon's Island, and for two years, a little over two years. Our guy was on display in the visitor center of the uh, paleontological department. That's the skeleton um, that is at, and, and that's Dr. Stephen Godfrey, who is the chief paleontologist at Calvert Marine Museum and was absolutely instrumental in helping us get the uh, extractions, bringing volunteers. We probably had a total of 50 to 60 volunteers working at, at different times. Um, carefully, you know, removing the sediments around this thing so we could bring it out. But uh, it stayed there a couple of years and then they ran out of room and wanted to change it. So we had to bring it home. And so we brought it back to Stratford after about a total of about four years at the at their museum. Well, that makes me wonder, John, um, I'm, I'm more familiar with archeology. span And of course, you know, we dig downward usually. Uh, but, how do you remove something that is in the side of a cliff? Right. I mean, well, yeah. there's some basic rules to that, okay? You work from the bottom up. You don't work from the top down. Okay. You work around the, the skeletal 
uh, piece, uh, removing um, material, uh, you know, so that you can, you don't want to take it down from the top, you work from the bottom. Uh, but you, you know, obviously you're working, cleaning off the stuff at the top too, but uh, generally that's it. One of the things people asked me about the cliffs was, wow, when, because the hole that we had to enter, uh, I, which I don't think there's a slide here, was about four or five feet into the cliffs. And people would say, wow, it, aren't you afraid it's gonna collapse you know, on top of you? One of the characteristics of the, of the sediments that make up the cliffs here at Stratford uh, is our interlocking crystalline structure of the sediments. They are very, very strong. It is characteristic of the type of sediment that um, it, bottom line is it wasn't going to collapse on us. And so we could easily bring it out. But uh, it took 12 people to drag it out, uh, sort of like, uh, you know, building the pyramids where you use the greased logs to bring it out. We used uh, logs and timbers and things like that so we could slide it out um, from its tomb. So... That is incredible. No, I was just really curious about that process because like I yeah. said, how do you remove something from the side of a cliff? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, it's any fossil is very, very rare. Okay. Fossil, the chance of fossilization in nature is literally some paleo guys that write about um, uh, the sub subject say that it's a one in a million. Others say, no, it's a one in a billion. Uh, opportunity for uh, any living organism to be preserved. I mean, the vast, vast, I mean, the immense amount of time and the, uh, and the chances of just being in the right place at the right time for a fossil to form is very rare. I mean, and I've been saying for years, one in a million. I may boot, bump that up to a one in a billion uh, organisms. So our guy, right, Thinocetus, is, a, uh, as all fossils, all fossils are extremely rare. Interesting. The fossil is part of what is called the fossil record. Um, the fossil record of the earth. Um, that's the, the chronological um, uh, time that, it, that all living things from its first fossils to the present would, would be included in the, the total fossil record of the earth. So I tackled a big subject here, okay. <laughs> Yeah, but so is it basically like a timeline of? Yeah, if you'll see, you'll see as we go through this. Okay, let me show you the next uh, slide. And I, you know, I dug this picture because it shows a couple of kids standing looking at this big ichthyosaur uh, that's mounted. This is probably from the UK. Um, the fossil record goes back into what geologists now, and I think we appropriately call a topic deep time. Deep time is, is geological time. Next slide. Now the oldest fossils found on earth currently, and lots of people are looking. So probably when I say this, you know, 10 people have found stuff older, but uh, this is what, from what I have gathered from the literature, the Strelly uh, pool in Pilbara, Western Australia has um, the earliest forms of fossilized life. You know, a lot of people think life occurred, I mean, it, well, you know, I, we're talking billions of years here. Earth is 4.567 billion years old. Um, the, uh, a billion is a thousand million, okay? A thousand million. So this is 4,000 million plus years ago. Um, the chemical and biological um, chain reactions that created life, really, um, were first evident in the fossil record. And the earliest stuff is now coming from Western Australia. Next slide. Uh, these are stromatolites, okay? Preserved mats, like mats, 
of microorganisms sandwiched between layers of cement, sediment. The fossils, and this is the, another picture of the Pilbara stuff, um, stromatolites are growing now. Uh, stromatolites, you can find living stromatolites in Sharks Bay uh, of the Great Barrier Reef area of Australia. Um, they look like uh, pillows on little pedestals. And, they're, uh, and they are very primitive. They're cyanobacteria. They are the, the simple, one of the simplest form of colonial life on Earth. And um, in fact, stromatolites are found many places in the fossil record. Um, well, I found stromatolites in Culpeper uh, when we were when I was working on some dinosaur tracks out there. Uh, stromatolites are um, a common, well, not common, but they are a uh, uh, characteristic of a type of bacterial growth. It's an algae bacteria symbiotic kind of thing going on, and they, it dates back. As, as I mentioned, um, at least three to four, almost four billion years. Wow. Not all organisms will turn into fossils. Again, that's, that's something that I, I'd like everybody in the audience and you know to repeat 50 times and then go on and share it with your friends. The, uh, the uh, fact that uh, we get the impression um, that fossils are everywhere. You know, when I was a kid, uh, Kelly, I was also into archaeology and I was interested. So I convinced a buddy of mine uh, after we got fired up in a fourth grade class, you know, listening to arche about archaeology. And we grabbed a couple of shovels and we went out in the backyard and we dug a hole and we dug this big hole and we dug for about two or three hours, me and my friend, and we came up with a bottle cap. You know, uh, that was it. Um, we put the shovels back and said, we might try this later on. You know, I mean, it, this is archaeology. No, I guess the point is, you have to go where the fossils are. You have to understand the fossilization process. And you've got to be a little bit lucky, like I was with the whale. Yeah. So since not all organisms will turn into fossils, that means that there's a lot of extinct species that we have no idea ever existed. There is. And I'm going to mention that in a moment, but I'll go ahead and um, okay. lay this one out. We, of all the living things that have ever lived on Earth, from those simple stromatolite mats to, to the present, of all of them, okay, maybe 5% have, have left fossil evidence. We do not know 95% of life on earth. We don't know because we simply don't know. Um, I just, one of the characteristics of fossilization is you need water. Very, 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 very rare fossils are found in anything other than stuff that's not associated with water. Water uh, is necessary for the, uh, as it transports muds and sediments to, to encase the fossil. Uh, it also carries the minerals that will leach out of, uh, into the bone material if it's a vertebrate. Here you go. The process of fossilization require very specific environmental, geological, and biological conditions. That's a lot. That Next. is. Yeah. Next. So, um, and you were you were touching on some of those, but uh, what what are the specific conditions required? You know, the, big, the big one is water the, and, and, of course, time. And, and, you know, human beings simply cannot grasp. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that again. We cannot grasp deep time. We can appreciate it. We can all stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon. We can all go look at stuff here at Stratford Hall. We can look at the cliffs. But, we, but in mentioning the fact that the cliffs are 16 million years old, or that this particular fossil is 8 million years old. It is impossible for the human mind to understand that length of time. It's, it, I mean, you can understand, you can see pictures of the pyramids, you can see pictures of cave paintings, you can see pictures of 
fossils and things and people can tell you stuff, but it is very hard for us. And you really do have to work at trying to understand how time, what time is, <laughs> what time is it? No, what time is uh, uh, it's, and it is the significant component of fossilization. You need lots of time and you need lots of weight and pressures. Um, when people say, oh, they found a new dinosaur uh, fossil out in Wyoming and stuff like that, and they, and they go out and they show you pictures of it, and they're, these guys are like mining, <clears throat> excuse me, mining a fossil from a top of a little butte or something like that. Uh, and, and you're going, well, it's just laying there. You know, they just sort of saw it. No, there, there were probably hundreds, hundreds, perhaps even thousands of feet of sediment above them. Wow. That, had, that had eroded away, you know? So um, what's necessary? The big one is time. Well, it's tied with water. Water, time, pressure, because the overlying sediments and muds compress the body as the, uh, as, and the um, cellular material of that body is slowly infiltrated by water and the water carries minerals this i mean this is a humerus okay that's this part okay i almost made a, I almost made a joke but it wouldn't have been very funny <laughs> this is a funny bone no this is the funny bone no this is a humerus of an extinct baleen whale probably similar to the guy that we that uh, we've been talking about it is a rock it's a rock it's all the cells in it have been infiltrated by minerals and have solidified okay and over time now that's amazing okay next is that okay absolutely thank you there just aren't many fossils compared to the trillions and trillions of living things that have lived on Earth. Next. The fossil record, remember that's really one of the things we're talking about today, the fossil record. What is the record of fossils on Earth? Of invertebrate animals without backbones, fossils goes back hundreds of millions of years. <clears throat> and these are, this picture, are from the Edicaria formation in Australia. Uh, these are, were, are soft bodied impressions. These are the, these are molds of an animal that laid, that died, and was slowly covered by very, 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 very fine sediments. And then the same process of time and pressure took over and we, because finding soft bodied animals like this in vertebrates is just incredibly rare. I mean, there's, but this, uh, the Edicaria formation in Australia, uh, and we have these, um, believe it or not, in Virginia, and we have these now being found, animal, animals similar to these found in throughout the United States and the world. But the first ones were in Australia. Okay. Now, in some cases, as incredible as it may seem, the evolutionary sequence of a particular animal group has been collected in detail. A lot of people say, well, that's really cool about fossils, but you don't have all that in-between stuff. You know, you don't have, well, yes, we do. We do. Um, the, on the left there, we'll talk about these guys in a minute, is the evolution of the whale. And then, of course, we have the evolutionary succession and, and radiation of elephants and the elephant-like animals. And then we have, of course, birds. We have theropods, dinosaurs evolving into birds over, and the, <laughs> this didn't take place on a weekend. This, this took place uh, hundreds of millions of years. But each of these animal groups provides a record of evolutionary change, which is extremely important in understanding not only what evolution is, but also grasping how uh, wonderful the, the pageant, so to speak, of life is. Next. The, the dinosaurs to birds, it just always makes me think of the movie Jurassic Park. I <laughs> well, of course. I mean, 
what we started out with with dinosaurs was just you know little dinosaurs running around and we didn't have any feathers on them well now we're finding uh, feathered dinosaurs this is new stuff i just added this slide uh the, the to the left is a cub of a cave lion one of two that were found and then there is a foal a young horse that was found. And these were preserved in the permafrost of Siberia, in the Arctic region of Siberia. Um, as the climate warms, and as paleontologists uh, begin to realize that the permafrost is beginning to melt in some places, um, other animals will be found. In fact, this is kind of a cool fact, the leading export of Russia before 1900, okay, so it's a long time ago. Before 1900, 1900, before 1900, the leading export, most uh, monetary export was mammoth ivory. Really? Mammoth, mammoth ivory. Mammoth ivory. Mammoth ivory, yes. It was that common and collectible. It would be turned into piano keys, turned into all kinds of stuff. But uh, mammoth ivory was a leading export of, of uh, I guess, pre-revolutionary uh, uh, Russia. Okay, that blows my mind. That, that really does. Next. So here, I had to throw this guy in. This is, the, this is now new stuff. This is the earliest vertebrate. There he is. That's our relative, so to speak. There he is. He lived 455 million years ago in what is called the Devonian period, in what is not, uh, and and was evolving in shallow near shore, near shore coastal environments. That's the earliest vertebrate that we know of now, and that'll change. Next, excuse me. The entire fossil record of the Earth is incomplete. Next. The fact that the fossil record is incomplete for most living things, right? Remember 5%, 95% now, has caused a lot of people to say, hey, wait a second, the evolution, that's not true. Evolution didn't happen. Next slide. Evolution is both a fact and a theory, okay? It's both. Facts, okay? Now, if you, uh, you went through middle school or high school and you did the science fair thing, you, you recognize the scientific method. Well, science is not finished. Science will never finish. Nobody has all the answers to any particular element of science. All the stuff dealing with whales and fossils and stuff, that's gonna change as more evidence comes forth, okay? Facts and science are based, based, facts are based on observable, you can see it, and measurable, you can measure it data. Okay, it's not made up. The stuff you're finding, we know that the fossil, the, the big whale that I found way back in, in uh, June of 2013, um, it, uh, we've measured it, we've observed it, we've recorded data on it. It is, it is, but is it the only baleen fossil that was evolving in the seas 16 million years ago? No. No, it was probably, as you'll see, one of many. But again, science is based on observable, measurable facts, okay? Not, well, I wish it was this way or I heard it. It's based on facts. Next. And theories, a theory is a framework to explain facts, okay? So when you hear about, you know, the theory of evolution or the gravitation, gra gravity is a theory. Well, these are accepted uh, frameworks, uh, sort of um, constructed mental constructions to explain uh, what, what we're looking at. Uh, and they have to be replicable. Theories change as new evidence comes into from the scientific communities. As more facts are brought in, theories are tweaked. 
theories are nudged as we as science grows. And that's the key element that I think, uh, you know, that paleontology and uh, the other sciences offer us as humans is a framework for understanding the world. Next. Scientific theory is a confirmed explanation of facts. Now it's confirmed. Could you go back just one second? Confirmed. Now, who's doing the confirming, okay? There isn't three paleontologists working on whales. There's not two paleontologists working on dinosaurs. There are hundreds and hundreds of people that, are, that have committed their lives to understanding elements of our, the life on earth. They, I mean, there are people, you, I don't care how small the bug is or how big the leaf is or how weird the dinosaur is. There are people that have been spending their lives and careers studying them and confirming these facts and then sharing them. Okay, next. Okay, this is a cool thing. You know, so the orange, <clears throat> I believe that orange bone is seen in each of these different uh, types of uh, vertebrate animal. And it, facts of evolution come from observable fossil evidence. So you see it in the fossil record, you match it with what's in the existing record, and you start pulling together these facts to explain um, certain elements. Next. Which vertebrates <clears throat> have the longest observable fossil record? Well, let's find out. Uh, the multi-tubule, I was having a hard time saying this, multi-tubulates, cubulates, multi-tuberculates, multi multi-tuberculates. Say it five times fast. <laughs> no, I'm not going to, but there you are. I don't generally use that, but that's it. 160 million year old, related to squirrels, um, are the, uh, the longest living recorded in the fossil record. We have evidence of them, okay? And there's a 55 million year history of horses. Okay, now we're talking. I like horses. <laughs> yeah, there you go. From, li from little fox size guys at the bottom to the huge Percherons and large horses that we have today. But we have a complete or nearly complete, well, I wouldn't say complete. I would say we have a, um, a thorough record of the evolution of horses. Next. And we have a thorough evolution of whales. Okay, so you're telling me this guy up here at the top that has four legs is a whale? Correct, Amundo. The uh, the uh, he is now. When you go to understand vertebrate animals, you look for groups that share similar characteristics. One of the characteristics of early whales, and that is Pachycetus up in the upper left hand corner, that little guy, the little guy running around on the four legs, that's Pachycetus. Okay, is that they had originally um, hooves, okay? And these uh, even-toed ungulates related to um, even-toed, like horses are even-toed and uh, uh, hippos are even-toed as you'll see. Um, they share skeletal characteristics that are, that are seen in the fossil record as they become apparent, as they are discovered. Pachycetus was discovered, I'm not sure, back in 1972 in Pakistan. And um, it shared the characteristics of even-toed ungulates, but other fossils that would be those animals that you see evolving to the large baleen whale on the lo lower right there, yeah, um, they too shared similar skeletal structures that um, link them together. Next slide will help a little bit. Okay, so all 
fossil, the, all whales are descendant of a land living mammal, even toed ungulates called artodactyls. Okay, artodactyls. And the artodactyls then, uh, and you can see uh, branched into the cetaceans and they don't have a, a pro, I guess about, well, I'm thinking about 60 million years ago. And branching off that group that would lead to the whales are hippos. And you can see hippos up there. Hippos and whales are related. Hippos stayed on land, kinda, though they're mostly aquatic now, I'd say they probably spend 80, 90% of the time of their life in the water. But cetaceans evolved in another environment. And the cetacean group of artodactyls would um, develop body structures and skeletal structures that would lend itself to a, a, a life in the water. Now, why? Next slide. How could a land animal end up living its whole life in water? Next. Next. What does the whale fossil record indicate? Again, what's the record show? What are the facts? Next. Hippos and whales evolved from four-legged, even-toed, hoofed ungulates, ancestors, that lived on land about 50 million years ago. Unlike the hippo, whale ancestors moved to the sea and evolved into swimming creatures over about 8 million years. Now, 8 million years, again, it's impossible for us to understand, right? Um, to give you an idea, two level tablespoons of salt equals 1 million. Okay, so if you ever wanna see what 1 million basically looks like, it, every grain of salt, table salt, uh, being one year, you can get an idea of what 1 million looks like. It's not crazy. It's just a lot. Eight, but 8 million years is pretty quick for, uh, for evolution to, uh, to really convert an animal. So why is that? Well, it's out of... Next slide. Skeletons of whales change so that a, a land-living four-legged carnivore could become a permanent... Okay. There he is, there's Pachycetus up at the top, and there's a big baleen whale like our guy jumping. Kind Next of slide. giant rat. Yeah, well, they sort of look like that, but they, the skull of a, of a, um, of a whale um, has changed to accommodate an, a, a, a aquatic lifestyle. Um, Evolution is driven by adaptations that will benefit the survival of the animal. A, it's like that old expression in, in biology, lose it or use it. I mean, you, it's gonna, you either are going to have a, um, uh, a, a body structure or a body component that will benefit your survival or you die. And you do not pass on your genes to the next generation. You are a failed attempt. So Pachycetus and the evolution of whales are a series of successes in, in evolution and successes in adaptation. Why did they stick with the water and the hippos didn't? You know, it's all about food. The ancestors of whales later returned to the sea, taking advantage of rich food supplies. Now, one of the characteristics of that time period of the, uh, uh, that, that whales were evolving in the geological time period are huge earth changes that were occurring. Uh, tectonic movement of continental plates, uh, ocean currents changing, food supplies changing. Hey, it wasn't just whales that were evolving. Because when you look at a biome or a community of animals, they all I mean, if you go outside today into a forest, all the animals that are living in that forest have to accommodate the environment or they're not going to make it. I mean, if, you know, I mean, right down to the color of the bird or the, or the type of bug or, the, or whatever. And they all are interacted 
are interacting together in a in a very complex exchange of energy. And uh, one eats something else, and another eats something else, and this energy is passed on. This the web of life is incredibly complicated, and just the whales are just taking advantage of one little component of it, one little corner of that biome, and that just shows you some of the stuff that they eat. Next, and I, you know, here are some things that changed in whales. Okay, the ear that's. I'm looking at this, see if you can find it on your, if you're looking at this, ear region becomes extensively modified to hear underwater. Crazy. All right, the uh, nostrils or nares of, a, of an animal are moved back to the back of the skull. Um, well, <laughs> their little no nostrils are now on top, we see them blow, we go, when a whale spouts that air and water up, right? That's, that's their nose, that's their nostrils. I mean, they're breathing. Um, and the uh, um, front legs, right, become paddles. You get, you start developing more vertebra. Why? Because you need to swim through the water. You need to swim and, and, uh, and move from one area to another quicker and more uh, with more agility, I guess. I don't know. And then there's, there's the back leg that uh, is almost completely gone uh, in this skeleton. Next slide. Whales were adapting for the best feeding strategies that they could find. Next slide. Baleen whales open their mouth, suck in huge amounts of, of seawater that are just chock full of all kinds of little yummies, and they are trapped by bristle-like gill rakers, okay, which we call baleen. And, the, and then uh, um, they swallow it and, they, uh, and get rid of the seawater and keep the good stuff. Um, so the whale, is that is looks all animals look the way they are so they can live period if they didn't look that then they would get rid of it and they they would modify uh their body structure through evolution and selection natural selection guys you know what works what doesn't work get rid of the stuff that doesn't work next next slide and they got huge the biggest animals to ever live on earth are whales. The blue whale, right, which is a type of bay, baleen whale, is now considered the largest living thing ever on earth. Now they can do this because if you live in the water, the water uh, helps you um, by keeping you afloat. I mean, it buoys up your body weight. You know what it's like. I mean, you kind of go into a sort of uh, uh, a um, uh, what am I, uh, the, um, you know, free floating uh, idea of being buoyed up by water, huge amounts of weight can be, uh, can be held up in water. And that's why you can get something as monstrous as, a, as these huge whales uh, that weigh, what, 60, 70, 80, 100 tons? Tons. Uh, then they can move through the water pretty quick. Boom, they, you know, they can get through and, and they get big. Why? Because there's lots of food. Next. Paleontologists aren't quite positive, um, but feel confident that changes in the ocean currents due to plate tectonics created feeding opportunities. This would lead to whales evolving into two large groups by the middle Miocene. Hey, just like we got here at Stratford. During the middle Miocene, you have two large groups evolving. Next slide. Early whales split into two body types. One type became toothed whales. This is a toothed whale. Okay, we all recognize that. And then, of course, the baleens. 
And they did this because a, a, a population of early whales must have been separated uh, geographically in the oceans long enough so that the adaptations necessary for their survival in that particular separated ocean could take place. And that's not gonna take place like I'm, I was kidding about the weekends. Uh, that would take place over tens of hundreds of thousands of years. But successful body types are rewarded by survival. Mm -hmm. So if you're successful, you get to pass on your genes to the next group. I'm not gonna lie, John, um, the, this guy on the bottom here is kind of terrifying. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, is a, that is one, that's an early toothed whales, early, uh, early toothed whales in the, uh, uh, I think Miocene, possibly Eocene, um, were, uh, I'm going to do a program in October about the scariest uh, animals in the oceans that, during this time, and uh, we'll talk more about uh, that boy right there. That, the, yeah, the right there, yeah. <laughs> toothed whales, yes. Uh, and I have teeth uh, from those type of whales in my collection at home. About 16 million years ago, there would have been many types of baleen whales competing for food sources. So you have lots of experiments going on, right? Which one's gonna make it? Which one is gonna be successful? Which one is gonna pass on their genes to the next uh, generation, so to speak? So there's this sort of competitive of, uh, competitive, uh, I don't want to get too anthropomorphic here or, or, you know, like subscribe to human characteristics, but there are a lot of competing experiments of baleen whales. Next. Most would have become extinct. Next. The Stratford whale is a type of baleen whale, as I mentioned earlier, similar to the minke whale. Mm. Kind of a cute name, minke whale. Next. You'd expect it to be small, called a minky. A little teeny, yeah, a teeny <laughs> the minky. Uh, anyway, the Stratford baleen whale is one type that became extinct. Thenocetus arthritis, arthriticus becomes extinct. Why? Couldn't compete, right? You had other, other types of baleen whale more successful, more people, more, more offspring, more little baleen whales, right? You have some types though that could not compete. So the Stratford uh, baleen couldn't compete and that line of baleen whales becomes extinct. Next. Well, it remains unclear <clears throat> as to how climate change might have specifically impacted whales. What is clear is that the change in Earth's climate causes in evolutionary changes. Uh-huh. And these changes are found in the fossil record. So we can see these changes and we can study ancient climates through examining the fossils that are remains that, are, that we're lucky enough to find. Next. As our world again enters a new period of rapid climate change, taking the time to look back at how past whales, okay, adapted may shed light on how today's whales will fare. Next. Already, there is evidence that whales are changing their migration routes and going after new sources of food. Whales and whale-like animals, or whales and their cetacean uh, relatives, uh, will adapt, as they have in the past, to the changes that the oceans are going to offer and that, uh, and now, fortunately, we're going into an era where man is starting to protect the whales more and, and from harvesting, uh, which nearly drove some uh, types to near extinction because of our, uh, our, our whaling processes and, and fishing practices that we did. So that's changing. So that's going to benefit whales too. Next. These changes will be seen in the fossil record of the future. Hmm. Next, next. So now I'm ready for whatever happens. 
I know. Okay, so now it's time for some questions. Um, let me see. Does anybody have any questions? Everybody got that? So uh, maybe maybe it's so complete an answer that you, you just just sort of headed off your questions before they happen, you know? <laughs> okay, John. Um, aw, thank you. So one person said that John's best program, um, one of John's best programs, got no questions. Well, hey, thank you. Well, <laughs> thank the, you know. You. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I know it's kind of hard to jump in and ask a question about sometimes about this because I think in a way we think we know a lot about whales and fortunately we do. I think the public understanding of whales and whale environments and, and, and uh, are, are, are changing uh, for the better. Uh, that we don't, uh, that we are considering them such a valuable part of the world's ecosystem that, uh, that we're going to, um, that we may, that, you know, I think the level of knowledge that people have is going up. So that's really good because the more knowledge and, uh, and understanding we have for the creatures around us, the better it's gonna be uh, as we uh, go through the next changes that we're all going through now. All right, now we do have one question, John, from Karen. Um, it says, was an attempt made to reconstruct the skeleton? Ooh, good question. The, 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 the I guess you're referring to the skeleton of the whale we found here at Stratford. I would assume so. Um, actually, uh, no. There has not been any real discussion about um, assembling it. Cleaning it has taken almost three years. So the, the, the prepping, as they call it, of, of the skeleton is, under, is still going on. And um, there are a number of, of mounted skeletal, skeletons of baleen whales that are uh, in big museums. You know, you can go to museums around the world and see uh, suspended from the ceilings or whatever, uh, huge skeletons of whales. Our guy is, again, is not that big. I mean, he's 25 so feet long. Yeah, uh, only 25 feet, you know. 25 feet, that's not, you know, that's, but um, I know that um, there are um, companies, resources, that that's their job. They take, and what they do is they take all the bones and they make little fiberglass copies of it. Okay, and once and then they put the good bones away, and then they mount at the fiberglass copies. So when you go into museums and stuff like that, you're not seeing the real bones. You're seeing the copies of the bones. The real bones of the dinosaurs and the whales and things like that are kept in uh, storage. Okay. Any other questions? Anybody? Okay, let's see, we have another question. Okay. Uh, Katerina asks, says you mentioned competition as a major drive of evolutionary change, but isn't adaption just an, as important and only sometimes related to competition? That's a good question, Katrina. Um, the competition necessary, well, Again, we have to stretch time out. We have to, and, and, and we're not, and try not to think of one particular type of animal. If you're looking at whales in general, the environment that the whale, like our guy, lived in is a complex system that is um, changes. Now, ocean environments don't change as quickly. Well, I shouldn't say that. Ocean environments tend to be, in some cases, more stable than land terrestrial environments, which have are more prone to impacts of weather and things like that. But adaptation, the whether it be coloration or um, 
some sort of body adaptation takes time, okay? So when you look at adaptation, you're looking at successful body structures that have incorporated those body structures to adapt to an environment. So, I mean, it, it, it's very difficult to think about this stuff because at adaptation and environmental change are going on constantly, constantly. Every second, there is a um, slight changes in the environment. Slight. Now, are those slight changes enough to create an adaptative change in the structure of the animal? Uh, maybe not, but if it's over a wide enough area and if the environmental conditions are stable enough for a long enough time, adaptation is going to catch up and you're going to have bodily structures that will have changed. So it's all about time. You got to have time enough to do these things. And once, and then you have to have the environment rich enough to support those changes. Hope that's close. All right. Well, let me see. It doesn't look like we have any more questions. Well, that's okay. Everybody, I hope everybody enjoyed it and, and learned and something. We are, we are right at our time. I want to thank you all for joining in with us today. Um, don't forget to tune in next month on September 11th for Birding the Miocene. John, do you want to give a little, a little yeah. blurb of that? This is, this is kind of cool. Okay, I'm not an ornithologist, but I've been lucky to find some bird fossils, okay? And um, the, what we see in the fossil record of this time period that we're blessed with here at, at Stratford is a time period where you see recognizable guys that are flying around. And then we also have some unrecognizable guys. We have a whole bunch of fossils that indicate birds were making transformations too. Adaptation was also driving bird morphologies and bird structures that was happening. So we're gonna take a look at what the fossil record shows about the birds and what it must have been like back 16 million years ago. If you could stand on the edge of the ocean then and look up to the sky. Sounds fascinating. I'm gonna to have to tune in for that one. Well, everyone, it was so wonderful. Um, I'm glad that you guys could join us today. John, thank you for all of your expertise on this topic. Um, Linda, thank you for your comment. Um, we, we, you are so welcome. Uh, we love doing these programs for you. Um, everyone, I hope you guys have a great day and uh, thank you again for joining us. Please tune in next month on September 11th. <laughs> Bye everyone. Yeah.